Union Square in the heart of San Francisco. It's The Cube, covering Spark Summit 2016, brought to you by Databricks and IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. Well, welcome back here on The Cube. We continue our coverage of Spark Summit 2016 here in San Francisco. I'm John Walls, along with George Gilbert, and we're now joined by Bill Jacobs, who is the Director of Advanced Analytics Product Marketing for Microsoft. Did I get that right, Bill? Pretty close. Yeah, good mouthful. Um, so Microsoft, very significant presence here. You're on the show floor, on the, on the general session stage today. Um, and you've made some, some pretty significant announcements here, very much of late with regard to not only what you're doing obviously with the Duke, you know, that, that's kind of old hat for you, but with Spark and how you're bringing that in to your, your portfolio of services. So tell us a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, let me, the, the backdrop is interesting. I'm actually part of an acquisition of Revolution Analytics and I came to Microsoft with an old view of the company with Microsoft the Windows company. Right. And uh, had been involved with Microsoft on and on through the years. When we came inside of Microsoft a year ago, I found a company that wasn't what I was expecting at all. And the best evidence of uh, my surprise is what we're exhibiting today, which is that um, one of the predominant offerings in the Azure cloud is a Hadoop-based infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. available for the price of a credit card and five minutes of your time to provision a cluster. What we're announcing is the ability to provision that cluster with Apache Spark. Uh, Spark 1.6 uh, uh, and a sub-rev of that is now generally available in the Azure cloud. And this makes it, again, a five minute exercise to select what kinds of machines, how many of them, punch go, get a cup of coffee and come back and you have a fully running Spark cluster. Um, that cluster also includes uh, Jupyter Notebook integration already uh, uh, in the product to make it very easy for data scientists to interact with that cluster. Um, we are talking about a little bit of work we've done with Cloudera to provide some RESTful interfaces to make it easy to manage Spark. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is there's an addition of that product, uh, a premium addition, that includes the R server technology, which Microsoft acquired. Um, uh, that's when I came aboard, uh, the acquisition of Revolution Analytics, that it makes it possible for our data scientists, who are not typically involved in um, uh, the deployment of large clusters, to take advantage of Spark as a very, very high performance back end for doing large data analytics. Our measures, um, uh, comparing a Hadoop MapReduce engine to the very same product deploying into Spark, is about a 7x performance boost, which is very surprising. It was a very well engineered, massively parallel algorithms that are highly tuned, and I didn't expect that we'd get more than four or five x performance boost. We're seeing seven. Uh, when we compare uh, five nodes of Spark to a, to a node of, uh, of, say, Linux running the open source R, the performance boost is greater than 100x. Mm. So there's a huge amount of performance just available for the taking for data scientists who otherwise would have to become quite schooled in, in Spark and Hadoop in order to stand up those clusters. Mm. Um, the last thing is simply that, uh, and this is the part that still amazes me, is Microsoft's thorough commitment to open source. Um, a very large measure of what we do in Azure is based on Linux, Hadoop, and now Spark and R and other languages are coming. So a lot going on, quite, a, quite an interesting time. Right. So have you seen, I mean now, now you're talking about a very rich big data infrastructure where the, the heavy lifting on Microsoft's part is um, automating the operation of that and making yes. it self-service. Yes, exactly. So what sorts of applications are you seeing coming on board you know, in these early stages? Because, you know, it used to be Windows Azure was the cloud. Yes. Took out Windows because they didn't want to confuse people and think they're only supporting Microsoft right. stack. Right. So what's coming on board? We're seeing a lot of things. Um, um, in my particular purview as a product marketing guy in the, in the advanced analytics side, we're seeing massive activity in financial services, in insurance particularly. Um, when you look at uh, the, the insurance companies, and I won't say their names, they offer you a dongle to plug into your OBD2 port on your car and measure how your teenager is driving. <laughs> what are they doing with that data? They're you're landing that in Oh yeah, I was going to say the same. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. No comment. Um, those types of applications that allow, uh, the, the, the general term in insurance is usage-based insurance. But what it really is, is much more finely tailoring the risk measure to the insured. Well, that's one example. In financial services, we're seeing a massive uptake of large uh, clusters being used for modeling fraud, credit card processors. 
uh, we are seeing uh, a, a big upswing in predictive maintenance. Uh, we just, uh, we have a couple of uh, major equipment manufacturers in the building business, I won't say their names because I'm not sure of the status of the referenceability of those. But if you think about someone who operates uh, large equipment, if they can cut their maintenance cycle, maintenance cost, by only going out when the machine needs maintenance, and being there an hour before it needs maintenance, they not only get a lower cost of maintenance, but a higher uptime for their user. And this pervades a whole bunch of industries. So that blends predictive maintenance, internet of things, technologies together. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, in fact, we actually heard we talked about uh, uh, airplane travel. Yes. Or, or airplane, you know, maintenance, uh, automotive maintenance, mm -hmm. agricultural equipment maintenance, uh, rail transport. Gas turbines. Uh, all those things, so yep. all these areas. I mean, is, is that, is, huge growth area, is that one of the key areas though? I mean, are, are, are there... You know, I think it's a sharp spiking area and here's why. And I, I did a little study on this. I, I have a history in manufacturing automation with Hewlett Packard years ago. Okay. And, I, and, and we started looking at the IoT business. Of course, Microsoft's involved in that business and we have other customers that are using other products. But when you split the IoT business into two areas, you come up with kind of an industrial IoT and a more consumer oriented IoT. My thermostat in my refrigerator or my car. When you look into the industrial IoT side, you find um, manufacturing automation types, this is not new for them. Yeah, it's a new data source, maybe it's more data. Mm -hmm. But I look back, how far back do you have to go to find the first instances of statistical process control? Well, it turns out it was Toyota, 1935, hmm. oh, well, in their first- Quality control. In their first automotive engine casting plant is how I read the, the story. That's how far back it goes. So that is a spiking industry because the knowledge of how to use statistics to improve manufacturing processes is not new. The chip guys, you know, what's coming down is a million dollars a day worth of silicon. If they can spot a defect earlier in the day, they cut the loss for the day due to a defect to a half a million or a quarter of a million. Mm -hmm. So these, these guys in industrial IoT, they know the value of statistical prediction mm -hmm. uh, on their processes. And as they extend that out into the product after it's delivered, if they can spot failures starting to occur in a line of cars, and there's some great stories there, they can improve the customer experience, cut the cost of the, the car, cut the cost of the service, uh, all, all for, the, uh, for the application of, uh, of some data science talent and big data to the problem. So that's spiking very quickly. The longer term stuff is where we're uh, um, perhaps going into combining um, a, a lot of data from a lot of sources that surround us as, as, as individuals and bringing that together with, uh, uh, to improve the customer experience at a retail store. Those kinds of things are, are, fat, are slower growing but probably bigger in the long run. But the industrial IoT business and the predictive analytics that has to accompany that, that's taking off very quickly. So, we've come at it from the capability point of view. Yes. And, and, the, and the benefit point of view. Um, Microsoft's got this amazing asset called a, you know, enterprise sales force. Mm -hmm. That they can, so they can go walk the halls of the customers and yes. ear to the ground and identify the opportunities. How does, um, how does Amazon, you know, they, they have a few years head start in, in these services, right. but how do they go to an insurance company or a, a semiconductor company and say, we know about this type of problem. We can help you take your on-prem software and you know, build a hybrid solution that over time moves you know, more and more to the cloud. Well first, it, Microsoft is far better positioned than many other vendors because we have a strong footprint in on-prem systems. The R server product runs both on-premises, on Hadoop and Linux and Windows and Teradata, and in the cloud, and that provides a bridging technology. But you ask about the Salesforce, and, and, and I spend a lot of time with our Salesforce, and I, and I spend a lot of time out meeting their, their senior executive uh, sponsors and their customers. The problem that all of us are dealing with this in, in this industry, particularly around data science, is identifying all of the constituencies. Tell more, that's interesting. There if are we, between two and yeah. four constituencies involved in every use of big data analytics. Somewhere's a data scientist. Might be called an actuary in the insurance business. Might be called a quant if he's you know, measuring risk for a middle office guy in uh, Goldman Sachs or something. The second audience is an app developer, typically, 
and a newer audience to the space because typically data analytics was a product unto itself. You produced a chart, you produced a prediction. Now that's being used to automate an application. Present the right ad to the client as they walk in the store. Present the right rating schedule when you rate their insurance. That's becoming an end-to-end -end process. The third audience in the equation is the IT guys. A lot of data science has been done in the past on desktops. This is a pretty good data science machine you got here until you tackle big data. Yeah. When that big data problem hit organizations, all of a sudden, CIOs said, I don't want any more shadow IT. I don't want any more appliances and closets in the marketing department. And they've taken control of Hadoop, the cloud, use of the cloud, and big data analytics. And so that's created this three-way team. And oftentimes when I go into a major account, I'll ask the IT guys, do you know who your data scientists are? And ask the data scientists, do you know who's standing up your Hadoop cluster? And oftentimes the answer is, well, we're not too sure. <laughs> and then the last audience is the guy with the checkbook, the vice president of marketing, the VP of manufacturing, who is actually funding these big data initiatives because he knows his competitors are doing it. He's the guy with the sense of urgency who has all this stuff anew. And so the hardest challenge is not the technology. It's, it, it's finding those constituencies, getting them engaged to present many perspectives of a solution so that they can agree that is the right solution going forward. We've spent a lot of time talking about technology here the past couple of days. You yeah. haven't thought about the internal politics, if you will. It's a or the human internal, problem. Yeah, you never really, it's hadn't really considered problem. that. You thought, almost take that as a given, right. Right, yeah. that everybody's pulling on the same oar. Yeah. And, and they are, but they just don't know maybe what boat they're supposed to be in. I don't know what the right and, analogy is. And even is, but among the data scientists. There's a little scientists. disconnect internally. And, and you'll even get a disconnect among data scientists. There are data scientists who have essentially a life sciences heritage. Mathematics, statistics, biology, population mm -hmm. science. They will be heavy R users because they've been teaching R in universities for a long time in that, in that world. Mm -hmm. What you see on the floor at, at Spark Summit here is a little bit more of a computer science bent, and that brings a different skill set. That brings guys who speak Scala and Java and hardcore programming languages. Mm -hmm. Even among the languages in use, you find a cleaving yeah. between those guys who science. have more of a science and, uh, and liberal arts treatment of problems and are very familiar with uh, the broad human problems of using data science, and the guys that are worried about how do I present the best ad you know, I mean, the, what's, the, what's the largest app on the internet? We all think of some things that are rather unpleasant to discuss, but probably one of the biggest is actually matching up ad placements with ad presentment for a quarter of a penny, and it pops up in the upper right of your, of your search window. You know, right, right. that's one of the largest apps on the internet. That's a scale that requires a very heavy duty computer science treatment. There are other problems where it's a life sciences problem, and so you see this schism even between the data scientists as to which is the right approach. R versus Scala, R versus you know, Java or Python. And in Microsoft, we intend to essentially embrace them all because we know those constituencies will all be present somewhere within the user base of Azure. So you, it, said, it, you said it, you know, it's an open source world at, at Microsoft now, uh, surprisingly so. Yes. Uh, from a former outsider, now insider, but uh, we appreciate the insight. Really, it's uh, a fun space. Yeah, good we stuff. Yeah, we appreciate it, Bill. Thanks for being with us here on the Cube. Enjoyed it. The Cube continues here from the Spark Summit 2016. Right after this.